the Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. This week, we take time to remember some of the newsmakers and personalities we lost in 2018. They include our 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush, who passed away earlier this month at his home in Texas at the age of 94. He died only seven months after the death of his childhood sweetheart, Barbara Bush, his wife of 73 years. Another loss this year, America's pastor, the Reverend Billy Graham, he dedicated his life to many people's souls. And we also lost a maverick, Senator John McCain, a war hero imprisoned and tortured by the North Vietnamese. He later became the Republican Party standard bearer and presidential candidate in 2012. And we celebrate the life of the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. We're on Facebook at Voice of America and want your comments and questions. We lost some remarkable people this year. Among them, former U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush, or 41 as his son, President George W., and the nation often called him. He died at his home in Houston, Texas. He was 94. The 41st U.S. President, a Republican who served one term from 1989 to 1993, was celebrated for Operation Desert Storm the U.S.-led military operation which successfully expelled invading Iraqi troops from Kuwait in 1991. He will also be remembered for his efforts to ensure peace in the Middle East and for being the quintessential gentleman. And we all know that Saddam Hussein... When the Iraqi army annexed Kuwait in August of 1990, then-President George Herbert Walker Bush formed an international coalition of air and land forces to liberate the oil-rich country and reassure allies in the Gulf region. The operation to free Kuwait was launched the following January. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. The U.S.-led Operation Desert Storm pushed Iraqi forces out within six weeks, and then Bush made the decision to stop the offensive. Many criticized that move as premature, but Bush's prestige at home and abroad skyrocketed. He used it to revitalize the Arab-Israeli peace process, and this effort resulted in the Madrid conference later that same year. His attempts to restore order in violence-torn Somalia in December of 1992, during the last weeks of his presidency, was less successful, and the fighting continued into the Bill Clinton presidency. Bush succeeded President Ronald Reagan in 1989 after serving two terms as his vice president. His own presidency saw major world changes, starting with the fall of the Berlin Wall during his first year in office. Then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and Bush and the last Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, announced a U.S.-Russian strategic partnership, signaling the end of the Cold War. But on the domestic front, Bush disappointed by reneging on his campaign promise to cut taxes. Read my lips. No new taxes. The Republican president was forced by the Democratic majority in Congress to raise tax revenues to curb the nation's burgeoning budget deficit. The economic recession and persistent questions about the conclusion of the Gulf War contributed to his failing approval ratings, and he lost his re-election bid in 1992. Following the election defeat, Bush retired from politics and made his permanent home in Texas, where he had made his wealth in the oil business. But he did not disappear from the public eye. Eight years later, he was active in his son's presidential campaign. This boy, this son of ours, is not going to let you down. He's going to go all the way and serve with great honor all the way. In 2005, at the request of his son George, who became the 43rd U.S. president, the senior Bush joined with former rival Bill Clinton to assist in Hurricane Katrina relief efforts. Among various honors, he was awarded knighthood from Britain's Queen Elizabeth and the Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. The former U.S. Navy aviator and decorated World War II veteran celebrated several of his birthdays with much publicized skydiving events, the most recent one at the age of 90. Slaritza Hoek, VOA News, Washington. For some historical perspective on the life of the former president, VOA's Jim Malone spoke with presidential historian and author Doris Kearns Goodwin. Here's part of that interview. 
Well, I want to start by uh, having you reflect on some notable passings in the year 2018, starting with the former uh, president, the 41st President George H.W. Bush, a long and distinguished career of government service, uh, a one-term president. But as you think about his legacy, what comes to mind? Well, I think the legacy of an entire life spent in public service is so important for young people today to see how honorable it can be when you think of which state he moved from one place to another and always put the larger interest ahead of his personal interest um, in, in the largest sense, I think. And I think civility, decency, moderation, compromise, humility. I mean, I loved when I was reading about it, you know, learning that there was one time when he was a young kid and he came home and he said to his mom, um, I made three goals in soccer today. And she said, well, how did the team do? And I think that was just a, a great thing to see that man. And I think he got the honor he deserved when he died. Another notable uh, passing of Senator John McCain, a well-known maverick of the Senate, a war hero at one time, uh, ran for president a couple of times. Uh, uh, his passing, of course, uh, coming while he was a sitting senator, but another legacy to evaluate. And again, another man who had a mission for the country that he put ahead of himself oftentimes, was a proponent of bipartisanship, tried to do something about campaign financing laws, and was willing to be able to buck his party at certain moments. And I think just the life he led and the openness that he had and the way he spoke his mind at various times, all going back to that experience when he was so heroic during the Vietnam War. I remember we went to Vietnam at one point and we saw that place where he was held for so long. And the idea that he decided not to come home when he could have gotten home given the privilege of his father and decided to stay with his fellow prisoners. I mean, that will always be remembered as a huge mark in his life. You know, when you think about both President Bush and Senator McCain, I can recall his, uh, his willingness to do a budget agreement in 1990 that raised taxes, that undermined a campaign pledge that had a direct bearing on his own reelection bid. He lost. And then Senator McCain, there's that famous moment when he addressed a supporter, I think it was in the Midwest, exactly right. who had accused uh, Barack Obama of being a Muslim, and he chided her and, and took the mic away. They seem to be of a different era now when we look at the politics of today. I mean, do they in some way kind of suggest or represent a different era? Yeah, I think one of the reasons why their passing made such an impact on people today is the context in which they didn't seem to be of a different era than, than what we see today. I mean, the highly partisan world that we're living in makes it less likely you're going to have somebody that was willing to buck his party, as was Bush Sr., and as was McCain. And again, when he spoke out against somebody who yelled about Obama, when we've seen rallies in recent days, when nobody stops the people in the rally from saying the things that they're saying. And so I think there was a yearning and a nostalgia for these people that you saw in the great turnout of people wanting to watch the funeral presentations. But I got to hope that it's not just that they're in the past. We've got to hope that maybe they're, for those few moments anyway, that we were celebrating their lives, it makes you yearn for that to come again. Unless you want to believe it can come again, it's not going to. So maybe on some people's part, they think, as I say, a young person might say, I can go into public service. It can be an honorable profession. Or I can buck my party. Or I can do a courageous thing. And that's what examples of historical figures show. And they are now historical figures. Hero. It's an overused term, so is patriot, but it aptly describes Senator John McCain, who dedicated his life to serving his country. He died August 25th at the age of 81, following a long battle with cancer. VOA's Michael Bowman looks back at the remarkable life of a revered statesman, war hero, and political maverick, John Sidney McCain. I would like to begin by expressing my appreciation and admiration. In his waning months, John Sidney McCain continued to speak vigorously about America. We are blessed. We are living in the land of the free, the land where anything is possible. And bluntly about perils he saw in the Trump era. To refuse the obligations of international leadership and our duty to remain the last best hope of Earth for the sake of some half-baked, spurious nationalism cooked up by people who would rather find scapegoats than solve problems. John McCain represented public service. 
He was a genuine American hero, not a phony, hyped up media hero. The son of a U.S. admiral, McCain became a Navy aviator and flew bombing missions during the Vietnam War. Shot down and captured by the North Vietnamese in 1967, he endured more than five years of torture and deprivation as a prisoner of war. Decades later, as a Republican senator, McCain would return to Vietnam. He championed the restoration of ties between Washington and Hanoi, as he told VOA, leaving the past behind. Look, there's some individuals that mistreated me in prison that I hope I never see again, but that doesn't change my opinion that the Vietnamese people are wonderful and, and dear friends and we need them and they need us. After the September 11, 2001 attacks, McCain decried torture tactics against terror suspects while backing the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. On Capitol Hill, he was known for a sharp tongue. Get out of here, you low-life scum. But he also displayed graciousness. McCain ran twice for president as an independent-minded Republican, securing his party's nomination in 2008. On the campaign trail, he defended his Democratic opponent, Barack Obama. He's an Arab. He is not... No? no. No man. No man. No man. He's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with. McCain lost the presidential contest and returned to the Senate, where he continued to advocate robust U.S. engagement around the world and a strong U.S. military as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. He did not respond when then-candidate Donald Trump questioned his war hero status. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. McCain became a persistent critic of Trump's governing style and policies, as well as hyperpartisanship in Washington, culminating with a decisive vote scuttling a Republican health care plan President Trump had championed. No. McCain was revered by Democrats and Republicans alike. Courage and loyalty. I can think of no better description of the man we're honoring tonight, my friend John McCain. John McCain, perhaps above all the politicians of recent years, was willing to reach across the aisle to try to do things that were good for the country, like immigration reform and campaign finance reform. Many will mourn his passing, but McCain remained upbeat to the end. I'm the luckiest guy on earth. I have served America's cause. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. The entertainment world lost a music giant this year. The legendary singer Aretha Franklin. In her 76 years on this earth, she sold more than 75 million records worldwide and earned 20 Grammys, including a Lifetime Achievement Award for songs like Respect, Chain of Fools, and Spanish Harlem. Loved by generations of fans, Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul, leaves behind a lasting musical legacy. In 1967, Aretha Franklin's rendition of the song Respect soared to the top of the charts, earning the singer the first of her 18 Grammys, the recording industry's most prestigious award. The hit song became an anthem for women. But everyone wants respect. Everyone needs respect from the young to the very old and in the middle, male, female. Uh, we all want respect and we all want to be appreciated. So it pretty much means the same thing to me now that it did then. Respect is exactly what the singing sensation received over a career of almost 60 years. From fellow artists, celebrities, presidents, and millions of fans around the world. I've been so many places in my, in my life and time. She achieved many cultural milestones along the way. 
At the age of 52, Franklin was the youngest recipient of the prestigious Kennedy Center Honors and was one of 14 legendary Americans to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005. Franklin was tireless, performing at countless venues, including President Barack Obama's 2009 inauguration. Many say she was as gracious in person as she was on stage. Music is my thing, that's who I am. Um, I'm in it for the long run, so I'll be around singing, what you want, baby, I got it. While the Queen of Soul may no longer be physically with us, her music will continue to reign for generations to come. Julie Tabo, VOA News. And from the Queen of Soul to a saver of souls, 2018 witnessed the passing of America's pastor, the Reverend Billy Graham, arguably one of the most significant religious figures in U.S. history. Billy Graham reached hundreds of millions of people worldwide through live broadcasts and sermons across the country. But as VOA's Jeff Custer reports, Graham will also be remembered as a personal pastor and confidant to several U.S. presidents. Come to know Christ for yourself. There's a peace. In Graham, for decades, held a Bible as he preached to more than 200 million people in 185 countries and territories. He staged massive rallies, the Billy Graham Crusades, that were attended by thousands of people and reached millions more via TV and satellite links. During seven decades of preaching, Graham declared that the belief and acceptance of Jesus Christ was the only answer to humanity's troubles. This crowd has been brought together, I believe, by the Spirit of God. The evangelist was a spiritual advisor and acquaintance of every U.S. president, from Harry Truman in the 1940s to Barack Obama in recent years. Graham was often asked to pray or preach at public national U.S. events, such as the inaugurations of new presidents. U.S. President Donald Trump commented on Graham's death via Twitter, saying there was no one like him. Speaking with the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Vice President Mike Pence noted Graham's influence on American society. Our nation awoke to the sad news of the passing of one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century, the Reverend Billy Graham. His ministry and his matchless voice changed the lives of millions and inspired our nation. Graham conducted crusades on every continent except Antarctica, in person and via satellite. As a result of his world travels, the quintessential American preacher concluded that Christianity is no longer a strictly white Western religion. Christianity is not a white man's religion, and don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. Graham, who had been suffering from a variety of ailments in recent years, was rarely seen in public. He died at his home in North Carolina. The world lost many notable personalities in 2018, among them celebrities and movie stars, astronauts and scientists, and even a few activists and global citizens who made their continents proud. More now from producer Velikia Newsom. Movie fans said goodbye to 1970s sex symbol Burt Reynolds and comic fans to Marvel Comics visionary Stan Lee, who died at the age of 95. That's for you, Stan Lee. That's for you, baby. You always will live in this heart forever. The world also lost British physicist and author Stephen Hawking. He died at 76 at his home in Cambridge. Well, Stephen Hawking was a huge personality worldwide. He had this amazing ability to connect with people. The fashion industry bid farewell to American and French designers Kate Spade and Hubert de Givenchy. An homage for Givenchy showcased dresses inspired by the creator's most iconic designs, worn by stars like Audrey Hepburn and Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Another towering figure, astronaut Alan Bean, who walked on the moon, died at the age of 86. Bean traveled to the moon almost 50 years ago as a member of the Apollo 12 mission. Well, it was like you won the lottery, only even better. And in South Africa, thousands of mourners packed a 40,000-seat stadium to celebrate anti-apartheid icon Winnie Mandela, who died at the age of 81. Africa lost another beloved figure this year, former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. A Nobel Peace Prize winner, Annan was hailed as a guiding force for good. As you heard in that report, the continent of Africa lost two giants this year. We asked VOA Africa 54 host Vincent McCory to weigh in 
He spoke to producer Mil Arcega about the respect and pride that many Africans felt for former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. He died in August at the age of 80. We can say he's one of the most, became one of the most prominent sons of Africa, one of the most high profile sons of Africa, uh, very, you know, dearly loved, especially because he wasn't like one of those African presidents who had any, you know, reasons to be hated by members of his country. In Ghana itself, it was such a, it was beyond a celebrity, it was like a, a demigod. It showed that an African is being listened to, that an African is being uh, respected uh, globally. Because remember, to get uh, that appointment, you needed like a strong support of the United States. You need a strong support of the Western powers. And to see a black African actually getting that support and getting the votes, it won uh, very strongly when they did the, the, the vote several times, actually, before it could be confirmed. And he demonstrated that he had endeared himself to the West also in terms of how he handled things on the continent, uh, how he handled the UN uh, peacekeeping missions and some of the issues that were critical, not only on the continent, but even in the, in the, in the Eastern Europe that mm -hmm. time when, when there was turmoil over there. He was one of the people who were very critical in managing those crises there. And therefore, for the continent of Africa, this was a source of pride. Uh, just seeing one of their own uh, at the head of a global uh, body like the United Nations, yes. that was really something that make Afri made Africans feel proud walking around, say, you know, one of us, Kofi Annan, is oh. the Secretary General of the United Nations. He did win this Nobel Peace Prize because of uh, all the uh, interventions he had participated in. He actually himself wrote a book called Interventions uh, Both in Peace and War. Mm -hmm. He had been known even after having left the position of UN Secretary General as being uh, an, a special envoy of the UN Secretary General to so many of the, uh, the peace uh, efforts across the globe, uh, both in the Eastern Europe, in, uh, in, in Africa, and uh, you know, different parts of the world. He was very, very key in uh, negotiating some of the peace deals across the world and therefore uh, this along with some of the work that he had done at, as, a, as a Secretary General of the United Nations uh, actually made him become a very very uh, strong candidate for the Nobel Prize. First he'll be remembered as a person who uh, you know to a large extent brought Africa to the global map through that position as a United Nations uh, Secretary General because remember that was like uh, for the continent of Africa that that body represents all nations. Right. So it was almost like the, uh, besides uh, perhaps the <laughs> President of the United States, the only other very visible person globally is the Secretary General of the United Nations. At least for Africans, that's how it looked. But he will also not go down in history without some, uh, uh, some criticism. Uh, okay. You know, he, during the, uh, the beginning of the genocide or the rumblings of the genocide in Rwanda in 1994, by around 1993, uh, he was in charge of the peacekeeping uh, operations of the United Nations. And uh, he has been criticized for not having done enough. And as a consequence, we had the genocide. Kofi Annan himself later on acknowledged that he should have done more. The United Nations should have done more. So to that end, to that end he did fail the continent in a big way because close to a million lives were lost in Rwanda. And it's believed that if Kofi Annan had done something, perhaps that genocide could not have happened or at least that many people would not have been killed. But overall, Along with some of the things he did, he did after he really advanced uh, agricultural development on the continent, trying to fight against uh, uh, hunger and famine, he still became, uh, you know, he redeemed himself to some degree. And I think he will always be remembered as a great son of Africa, not exactly a perfect son of Africa. Vincent also spoke to us about South African activist Winnie Mandela. She died in April at the age of 81. She was married to former South African revolutionary and later president Nelson Mandela during his 27 years in prison. Winnie Mandela was a hero to many in the anti-apartheid movement. But people have to always remember that it's because of Winnie Mandela that Nelson Mandela's name and fight for freedom stayed alive. There were so many other men in prison, men and women, but Winnie Mandela uh, on the streets of uh, South African cities and in Soweto and, uh, you know, globally, she championed the, uh, the fight against apartheid using her husband's name. And because of that, people constantly 
had Mandela's name in the news, in that struggle, uh, the name of Nelson Mandela was more prominent than the names of all the others who were in prison at that time. And all that credit to Winnie Mandela. She it suffered was. a lot. She was harassed by the security apparatus there. She was bitten. She was uh, detained uh, many, many times. In fact, sometimes she was taken away from her own children. Mm -hmm. I visited the house in which she used to live in Soweto, and you would see um, bullet marks on the walls. And she suffered for many, many years. And many people would say, if there wasn't a Winnie Mandela, probably people wouldn't be talking about Nelson Mandela. Not in the way that we talk about him, because remember, there were other men in prison with Mandela. But because of Winnie, everybody got to hear about Nelson Mandela every day. She was a great daughter of the continent and of South Africa, not only for keeping the name of Mandela alive, but actually for really being also at the head of this struggle in South Africa, ANC and the Obkonto and Sinzwe. Uh, she was at the head of that alongside with other men and women. But she was not a perfect woman, just like all of us are not perfect human beings. So there are a few things that happened, including some of the methods she used in uh, trying to uh, fight against uh, you know, those people that were perceived to be betrayers of the movement. And therefore, when Mandela came out, he wasn't exactly uh, happy about some of the things she had done. She did it thinking she was trying to kind of rein in some of those who were seen as uh, rebels within the struggle itself. Some kids were killed at some point and she was blamed for that. Mm -hmm. So because of some of that and, uh, you know, kind of some, some changes I think had happened in her personality and they clashed a little bit after that, they ended up divorcing. They just couldn't see eye to eye on a few things. Mm -hmm. But uh, it appears like it wasn't going to be good for Nelson Mandela as the president to have a wife who had uh, done a few things that were completely against what they stood for as the ANC, the African National Congress. Uh, Winnie Mandela was the most, one of the most influential people, even within not only the ruling party ANC, but in the country. When Ma Winnie Mandela spoke, everybody listened, uh, despite of uh, some of our weaknesses. She was extremely controversial, but extremely popular and loved by South Africans. And so uh, even when she died, you could see that uh, perhaps there hasn't been any other funeral bigger than really? uh, Mandela, Nelson Mandela's uh, funeral. After, you know, after Nelson Mandela, it was Winnie Mandela. Yeah. She's an icon to millions of women across the continent, but also uh, she was a great inspiration to all who fight uh, against oppression. Because she was a woman who was fearless. She did things that some men couldn't have even dared to do. She was not afraid of, afraid of anybody. Before we go, I'd like to share my choice for plugged in person of the year. He's not famous, but his mission is meaningful and inspirational. His name is Rodney Smith Jr., a man who started out simply doing a good deed, mowing the lawn free of charge for an elderly neighbor. Now his volunteerism has turned into a full-time mission. For the second year in a row during the holiday season, Rodney Smith has played Secret Santa to the homeless. He has just finished visiting all 50 U.S. states, giving away thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gifts, ranging from simply toiletries and blankets, survival items for the homeless, to specially requested gifts like shoes, cell phones, even hotel stays to those in need. In the near future, he plans to expand his operation internationally to help those in need worldwide. Rodney Smith is the gift that keeps on giving. I admire him. And he is my plugged in person of the year. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thanks for being plugged in and Happy New Year.